This is CBC Here and Now. Sharing the bounty. Protein rich, free ranging, organic, nutritious meat. The province is poised to make changes to help hunters donate to food banks. Some houses are gone, others still standing, but maybe not for long. I'm Malone Mullen in Port of Basque, and I'll have the latest coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. We'll get to those stories shortly, but first, a community in crisis. The mayor of Happy Valley Goose Bay says council has been forced to hire a security company to help protect residents from violent and lewd behavior. About 80 people have been living in the woods, and George Andrews calls it a major public safety issue. He doesn't believe the situation would be tolerated in any other community in the province. I have folks that have called me crying because they've uh, their cars, uh, they went to a particular location in town, a store, and their cars have been beaten on, demanding money. Uh, I've had folks call and say that they've seen people fornicating on a on a, on a monument that we have here, uh, you know, in in memory of of you know the United States Air Force uh, here. We've had people defecating on on uh, you know patios of restaurants, and it cont continues. Uh, places broken into, uh, people chased. Uh, people having near misses uh, crossing uh, with folks crossing the road. Well, some nights, he says, RCMP are able to offer some support, but it's not enough. Andrews says there are complex issues at play, mental health and addictions, but his town is being held hostage. We're not done with this story. We'll return to Happy Valley Goose Bay for more with the mayor in about 30 minutes on Here and Now. Proposed amendments to the Wildlife Act aim to make it easier for hunters, fishers and foragers to donate what they harvest to food banks. It's a change that's been gathering momentum for more than a decade. Here now's Mark Quinn has that story. At this time of year, hunters like Barry Fordham are doing their best moose impressions. Hoping to attract hundreds of pounds of food like this. This moose was donated to a charity this year. This one fed hundreds of people last year. And here's how they're transported from bogs to towns, in the trunks of cars to places like this food bank in St. John's. Fordham is the co-founder of Sharing the Harvest. Since 2008, he's been pushing for change to make moose and caribou part of a food bank's offerings. Protein rich, free ranging, organic, nutritious meat. This week, his delivery to Bridges to Hope Food Aid Center is two bags of ground moose meat. It was just a great, good feeling thing about it. We're not getting anything out of it. We're all volunteers, we're not getting paid, but what we are getting paid for is the feelings that we get right here today. With moose now in food bank freezers, it's an option for people who wouldn't have had access to that meat. Oh, absolutely, yeah. especially the seniors, you know, in Newfoundland, they love a bit of moose, right? especially at a time when groceries are getting more expensive and more people, people with jobs, are turning to food banks. We started opening on Wednesday nights as we are, have a new demographic of people who work. So uh, even the people that work now are uh, needing to go to the food bank, so that's a kind of a sign of where we are. These moose donations have the potential to keep fridges here filled with meat. It's not a novelty, it's become a necessity because ground beef has become too expensive, and a donation like this one can go a long way. So last Thursday I made 400 mole of bowls of moose stew. <laughs> so, you know, there's different ways we can deal with it. Two years ago, the province issued permits to food banks to allow them to accept donations from hunters. Now, in the next few weeks, they're expected to make more changes to formalize and regulate the process. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Meanwhile, the food bank at Memorial University St. John's campus has been forced to close due to a surge in demand. Volunteers hope to reopen again next Wednesday once shelves are restocked. The head of the food bank says demand is up, food prices are up, but donations have stayed the same. 
The demand over the last couple months has just been more than we could have possibly predicted. Um, you know, usually from August to September, we might see a jump of one and a half times usage. We saw two times usage in September. Uh, so we went from about 150 clients to 300 clients in September, and we were on track to doing closer to 500 clients this October um, had we not had to shut down. Obviously, I mean, tuition more than doubled starting this semester for new students and students who started the year before. But in addition to that, we are also seeing a housing crisis here in St. John's. We are seeing students struggle with the rising cost of food, which is an issue that links directly back to the food bank. And I think all in all, it's becoming harder and harder for students to actually focus on their education because they have so many other barriers coming up to them. Next Wednesday, students are going to be going all out like 99 in a student strike happening right here at the clock tower. Um, on November 2nd and I think this is really something that students are needing to see right now students aren't being prioritized people aren't being prioritized anybody who is low income is struggling well a campus church group is stepping in to help in the wake of that temporary closure on Halloween it's holding a trick or eat food drive at the breezeway a campus bar for undergraduate students a lot of students are struggling right now they're um, the food bank has doubled like their reach. So as a result, Mosaic um, kind of wants to help them out and they're gonna be basically a bunch of college students are going trick-or-treating for non-perishables. Well, it was another record-breaking day, three days in a row. In fact, take a look at some of these numbers. Mary, Mary's Harbor, 21.7 degrees. That broke the record back in 2017. Another record-breaking day for Wabush, in, in fact, smashed it. The old record was 13.6, and today you reach 16.1. But notice where the records were. They were back from 2017. So I thought we'd go back and kind of look at and see what that setup was and uh, very similar to what we're seeing today. So that big ridge of uh, ridging, I should say, allowing some of that warm air to move in. This was back in 2017. Take a look at what the ridge looks like today. Similar pattern and we're going to see this continue as we head through the next couple of days. But by the time we get into Friday, we'll see that trough move in. Some colder air will move in as well and I'll get into the full forecast coming up. It's been over a month since Fiona swept through port of basque leaving behind a trail of destruction. For nearly five weeks, residents have been digging through the remains. Many have also been waiting and wondering when and if they can ever return home. Here in now's Malone Mullen is back on the ground in port of basque tonight. So Malone, can you give us a sense of what the town looks like now? Well, Carolyn, despite uh, what you see behind me here, a lot of the debris has actually been cleared up. It's uh, it's a lot cleaner than the last time I stood right here. But uh, some of the hardest hit houses, those are now gone completely. Uh, some of the ones that were just damaged with flooding, those are still standing. But now the big question is, for how long? Trying to save stuff. You can see the water, how it came in. and That back corner was where it came in first. This is Denise Pike Anderson's dream home. It's a bit beat up, but it's still in one piece. Last month, Fiona swept through it. A wave flooded her bottom floor, soaking everything, but it left the house itself intact. So all of this, all my boys' movies, gone. Anderson is one of a group of homeowners here who waited for over a month, nervously, for provincial inspectors to decide whether they could return and repair or whether they'd have to say goodbye for good. She got this letter on Friday. She was called into town hall and told her house was condemned, now officially on the demolition list. It was just a blow, a blow to us that, you know, what we worked hard for is coming down. And this is mine and my husband's. And when my kids come home, they wanted to come home and help. And I said, you can't come home, we're homeless. The town's mayor says a steady stream of people got the same letter, coming into the town office, clinging to hope, leaving with hopes dashed. It was a very emotional couple of days. Um, you know, some people knew the fate of their home. They knew what it was going to be. Others were still, it doesn't look good, but yet we don't know. And uh, we, we got to wait and see. And then officially getting the news 
uh, that they wouldn't be going back to those homes and they were going to be inhabitable. It was, uh, you know, it was pretty emotional at times here. Uh, there were many breakdowns here, of course, and which was expected. And, uh, and in some cases, there was a little bit of relief of finding out what, what it was happening. For Anderson, the wait is now over. She knows she's never going home. But she says she's still wondering what happens next, whether she'll get back enough money from government to rebuild or buy again. She's not even sure when she'll be allowed to remove her belongings. Everybody's at a standstill. And this is supposed to help us, I guess. For now, her days all start the same up early to see what she can save from the rust and the mold before it's all lost forever. So Denise is now uh, one of quite a few people who have learned that they are permanently displaced. But amid all of this grief, there is actually a silver lining. And I'll have that story coming up a little bit later on in the show. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Malone. Well, shifting now to health news, officials are reporting three more deaths due to COVID-19 over the last week. All three deaths were in the Eastern Health region. Two of those people were 80 years old or older. The other was in their 70s. As of today, nine people are in hospital due to COVID-19, the same number as in last week's update, and no one is in critical care. We have reaction now to a story here and now brought you last night. The acting PC leader is questioning why the health minister waited two weeks to confirm an incident at Western Health. Barry Petten says he was shocked by those new revelations about inappropriate photos taken of a patient in long term care. It's quite disturbing. When I heard that scene, that I heard this story last night, it was brought to my attention. I was, I was, I was flabbergasted to be quite honest with you. And I, uh, and I think you, everyone should be. I mean, this. Pretty serious. So how widespread is this? Well, still with health care, hundreds of registered nurses rallied to call for better working conditions this afternoon. Their cries come as a crisis continues to grip the health care system. As the CBC's Heather Gillis reports, the province's nurses union is demanding change and launching a new ad campaign. Busloads of nurses aired their frustration with the health care system this afternoon. Healthcare, we care! Healthcare, we care! Healthcare, we care! Healthcare, we care! They rallied in St. John's and raised a long list of issues. Hospitals in overcapacity, closed or overflowing emergency rooms, mandatory overtime, 24-hour shifts, hundreds of vacant jobs, and high rates of injury and violence. Our health care system is on life support. And you are the people who are keeping it going. But at a cost to your own mental and physical health, and that's not right. Beyond COVID, but not beyond repair. Nurses Union President Yvette Coffey says things could get worse. She says their data shows 40% of nurses say they'll leave the profession if things don't improve. Our members have had enough, and I think the public of Newfoundland and Labrador have had enough, and we need to stand up for our health care system. Coffee says problems aren't just affecting nurses. She says they're seeping into patient care, and people aren't getting the services they need or deserve. Healthcare is beyond broken, but it's not beyond repair. Nurses are also calling for the public to rally with them to demand better health care. They're also urging people to contact politicians about the problems. Registered nurse Sarah Stratton says it's because the they're fighting for their healthcare. patients. That's why we're reaching out to the community. We want our community members to stand with us and be heard because it's their health care we're looking for. It's their health care we're trying to take care of to get them better results in the end. Today's rally comes as nurses begin their collective bargaining with the provincial government. President Yvette Coffey says she can't talk about details about how bargaining is going so far. However, she will say that themes at today's rally are similar to ones they'll bring up at the bargaining table. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. 
Well, there's been yet another delay in a murder trial in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The trial was scheduled to start on Monday afternoon, but jury selection took longer than expected. Now an unexpected delay is causing opening statements to be pushed back. As we reported last night, Vincent Ward is charged with second degree murder from an incident in 2018. Vincent Dampierre of Montreal was shot and died in Labrador City that April. At the time, police said the two knew each other. The trial is now scheduled to begin next Monday. Returning now to the cost of living, the Bank of Canada continues to make fighting inflation its top concern and, as expected, has once again boosted its benchmark interest rate. Today's increase is one half of a percentage point, putting the bank's policy rate at three and three quarters percent. As the Bank of Canada explains, it's a deliberate effort to reduce consumer demand so supply can catch up. We need the economy to slow to rebalance demand and supply and relieve price pressures. Inflation is currently running at 6.9%, which is down from earlier in the year. The bank's target inflation rate is 2%. Today's hike is the sixth consecutive increase since the bank started raising rates in March. Macklem also anticipates further interest rate increases ahead. Rising rates are putting the squeeze on people with variable rate mortgages and lines of credit. It's not leading to more people declaring bankruptcy in this province, or at least not yet. One insolvency trustee says the number of people unable to pay their debts is still much lower than it was pre-pandemic, but he's worried about what will happen this winter when people struggle with higher fuel costs and higher interest rates. I've been having more and more difficult conversations with people about how much they're struggling. Uh, insolvency rates aren't really up, but it seems like the general consensus is that a lot of people are struggling to make ends meet as the cost of everything has been going up and interest rates going up is just squeezing them further. Now, Sean Stack says a given year in a given year, only about 20 percent of mortgages come up for renewal. So he says many homeowners aren't yet affected by the rising rates. Well, a two-day showcase for businesses in Placentia Bay concluded this afternoon, and it happened at a time of renewed confidence in one of the province's most industrialized regions. Here now, Terry Roberts brings you that story. The star of the Sea Hall in Placentia, crammed with business exhibits, delegates shoulder to shoulder, sharing meals and ideas, and commenting on the positive vibes in the room. If this continues, I think we'll uh, about grow our, our venue for the next year. It's the 25th anniversary of the Placentia Bay Industrial Showcase, and the pandemic blahs appear to have been replaced by optimism. The sky is the limit. We're very, very excited. The vibe is very positive for sure. The Placentias are home. And talk about the challenges of making the most of all the opportunities that are either in high gear or on the horizon. We all have to recognize the changing economy, our changing world, and of course the emphasis on renewables. Delegates gathered not far from this, the sprawling port of Argentia. It's a hub for a wide range of sectors, from mining, shipping and oil and gas, to fishing and aquaculture. But lately there's talk about renewables as well. A massive wind and hydrogen project is planned for the port. And Argentia is poised to become a storage yard for wind turbine components being transferred from Europe to the United States. The national and international notoriety of the port and what it can do with its own infrastructure has really changed the dynamic in our region. And then there's this, paused for two and a half years, 65% complete. It's the concrete gravity structure for the West White Rose offshore oil project. Early in the new year, hundreds of workers will be called back for a massive concrete pour that will change the port's landscape. Hopefully if the big slip can start in the Q2 of 2023, uh, you'll see us really ramp up to about somewhere between 1,500 and 1,600 craft. It's very good and it's good for us, uh, for the province, because we get our trades workers back to work. The massive platform will rise from its current height of 50 metres, equal to Italy's leaning Tower of Pisa, to nearly 150 metres, higher than Egypt's Great Pyramid of Giza. The plan is to float the structure out to sea in 2025, made it with a topside that's being built in Texas. A couple of months of hookup and commissioning, and then we'll start turning the bit. Hopefully we'll have first oil in 2026.
It's the kind of news that's boosting these delegates with hopes of more of the same as investments grow, infrastructure is improved, and job numbers intensify. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Placentia. The lineup has been released for this year's Spirit Song Festival in downtown St. John's. First Light's week-long festival of music, dance, art, film, and culture is celebrating its 10th year. Organizers say the festival ignites a passion for indigenous arts and culture. It starts November 20th, and the lineup includes local and international performers such as Deantha Edmonds, Snotty Nose Reds Kids, and rising star Logan Stats. Well, speaking of music, coming up, we'll tell you about that catchy tune that's catching attention. A new act out of Labrador that began as a way to get through the pandemic is looking at possible awards. And do you like this warm weather? Well, there's a few more days of it before we get into some cooler, more seasonable air. I'll get into those details coming up.
time for a look at the weather and Ashley, I can't get over these temperatures. I know it's very mild out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I showed you some of those records before smashing from 2017 and we're seeing you know, day three of these mild temperatures. And it does look like some of them are going to continue. Oh, great. So if you like this mild weather, you'll be very happy. I do. But uh, yeah, let's take a look at the temperatures today. So not quite as warm here in St. John's today, about 15 degrees. But as you head towards Terra Nova, Gander, Badger, all between 18 and 20 degrees today. The hot spot was in Badger. Uh, again today. Oh no, sorry. It was Mary's Harbor 21 degrees. How can I forget that uh, with your record uh, this afternoon and uh, 18 degrees in Makovic as well as Happy Valley Goose Bay and 17 in Nain this afternoon. So definitely seeing lots of warm temperatures. Now uh, another live shot tonight outside. I know it's dark, but it's still a beautiful shot there and uh, Temperatures right now currently sitting at 15 degrees in St. John's that dew point at 13, which makes that humidex feel more like 18. So if you walked out the door this morning and you're like, it feels a bit humid, you're it, you were right. And uh, we're seeing some of that humidex values uh, between 19 and 21 right now as well through Badger, uh, Deer Lake, Corner Brook, uh, and even uh, not quite as humid up across Labrador, but you're still feeling about a degree or two warmer feeling more like 19 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So taking a look at what's happening, the reason why we're seeing this humid X is where the dew points are sitting. So there's a look at uh, what happens when we start to see those temperatures or dew point temperatures between 12 and 18. That's when you start to get a bit more uncomfortable. But right now those dew points uh, around 16 for Deer Lake and uh, 14 for St. Lawrence. Same thing for Port of Basket. As we head through the next couple of days, particularly into tomorrow, uh, we will see those humid X values again uh, quite mild. So your dew points will be sitting between 15 and 16 degrees. That's when things will start to feel a little bit sticky, but look at what happens. So this is uh, the drier air. So already uh, dew points down to about minus five in Lab City tomorrow, and it's along a cold front that will sweep through as we get into Friday, and that's going to drop those dew points and also drop the temperatures. Uh, it'll be much drier air as we get through to Friday. Taking a look at satellite radar, not a whole lot happening. We do have some cloud cover over the northern peninsula, but other than that, nothing. But if I zoom out, this is where all the weather is. So over Ontario uh, and the Atlantic provinces starting to show some of the white stuff showing up on the radar as well, and this will be our weather maker as this system starts to get its act together and head towards Labrador as we head through uh, the day on Thursday and then eventually into Friday. And as that cold front moves through that snow that you're seeing on the radar, it's going to start to affect parts of Labrador. So taking a look at the overnight tonight, a few showers certainly possible. Uh, they should be fairly uh, localized, but that chance will still continue. And as we get through the overnight, the better chance of showers will move in and particularly into Thursday morning, especially up across Labrador, West Coast and the Southwest Coast. Now also with this system, we are going to see uh, the winds ramp up as well. But overnight tonight, not a whole lot to talk about as far as winds are concerned. Temperatures are going to stay mild again, 12 degrees overnight for Lab City. Uh, that is significantly warmer than what we should be seeing this time of year. And as you head towards the coast, that's where we'll see those coolest temperatures between five and seven degrees overnight tonight. Otherwise, between 9 and 13 across the island. Again, those winds, not a whole lot to talk about, but as we head through tomorrow, that's really when those winds are going to ramp up, particularly for the rec house area, where you could see some gusts around 100 kilometers per hour through the day tomorrow. Now, taking a look at what's going to happen, that uh, shower activity will move in pretty much spread across the province uh, with some heavier showers possible up across the big land. More uh, uh, isolated, I would say, or at least some periods of showers uh, across the island tomorrow. We'll likely not see that until the evening hours for the Avalon. Uh, and then once that cold front moves through, we see that colder air move in and then the potential for some flurries will move in overnight and uh, for you across the big land. Temperatures tomorrow, again, 18, 19 degrees for the most part, maybe a little bit cooler along the south coast, only by a few degrees between 16 and 17. As you head towards central, again, similar forecast with that uh, humid X likely feeling in the low 20s tomorrow. And then for the west coast, those winds out of the south, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour, the winds will eventually uh, go down below warning criteria for you, uh, for those of you traveling through the rec house. And then for the northern peninsula, Southeastern Labrador still hanging on to those teens tomorrow with that chance of shower southeasterly is 20 to 40. And then another day of warm temperatures. But again, you'll see that in the morning, 14 degrees, 
and then drop like a rock. Similar forecast for your Friday across parts of the island. I'll get into the details coming up. What started as a way to make a living during the pandemic has turned into two albums worth of material and now two Music NL Award nominations. Here and now's Daryl Din has this story from Labrador West. The pandemic forced many artists to change how they created, including musician Scott Neary. I'm originally from Wabush, from, I grew up in this house and the pandemic sort of forced me to leave Toronto and come back here and try and make music some other way than in a big city. Um, and that's where I met Matt and Jen. The three hit it off and shortly after they prepared for their first online show. As for a name, they wanted something local, but different. Ptarmigans are in abundance in Labrador and the band was getting together as COVID unknowns had everyone fearful. That's how the band's name Ptarmageddon came about. Jamming with two musicians like Scott and Jen was a, was a thrill really. Um, and we got a lot of great feedback. That feedback eventually led to their first EP album. I was just having a, a bad week at work. <laughs> and, and I called Scott and I was like, man, I'm taking a week off. I'm taking a vacation week. Let's just, like, let's get together and, and write some music. But yeah, we, we just wrote for the sake of writing with no intentions of even making a record. And I think it was on day six. We wrote six songs in six days. And I said, guys, this is crazy. We have a gig booked one month from now. Let's try, let's record these. Let's record these right here in this very room. Let's make a record um, and release these six songs the day that we do this gig. That album of six songs and the music video they shot got plenty of attention. Of course, we love playing together, so we just wanted to keep doing it and keep playing shows and. Um, so then we decided to apply for a grant from Arts NL, uh, and they funded our second EP, um, as well as our first music video. Then came the attention from the music industry and Music NL nominations for Alternative Artist of the Year and Rising Star of the Year. It was a pretty big surprise, I think, for us. Like I said, a little, the fun little project that we started uh, is now a two-time nominated uh, project. That first EP was made just over a year ago with the idea of just having a good time with no expectations. But its success hung over them as they recorded their second. Um, but it was a little harder to put together because it also felt like uh, there was a little more on the line this time. But now it's ready for release. Their second EP called Dream Logic will be released to Spotify at the end of November to coincide with their show at the Labrador West Arts and Culture Center on November 25th. Daryl Din, CBC News, Wabash. Well, for the first time in four years, Music NL's annual celebration is back on the road, and it's back in Cornerbrook. The pandemic was tough on the performing arts and musicians in particular. Look back over the last two years, the music sector was one of the hardest hit, the first to close to lack, the last to come back. So I think the biggest challenge is getting everyone in their communities out and enjoying this, spending some money, buying some merch from that local artist, but buying that ticket and really getting out and, su and supporting them because they really need our support right now. Well, music Week kicked off last night and will continue all week. Staff are busy preparing everything needed for that celebration. Rhonda Tulk Lane says they're welcoming a wide range of delegates this year. We have over 40 international, national and local buyers coming to sample our artists and, and get them set up for the next year. We're also seeing, of course, a local artist community. We're also seeing a lot of young people. So this week, not only do we celebrate the best in class for 2022, we're working with our new emerging artists. People defecating on, on uh, you know, patios of restaurants. And it, conti it continues. Frank talk from a frustrated mayor about a disturbing situation. Public safety is a huge concern as dozens of troubled people continue to live in the woods at the edge of a Labrador town.
public drunkenness, lewd behavior, sexual acts, and illegal conduct at all times of day. That's how the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay describes an escalating problem in the community in a written message to residents. Dozens and dozens of people are living in the woods. The reasons why they're there are complicated, according to government officials, and the solution even more so. Joining me now is the mayor of Happy Valley Goose Bay, George Andrews. Mayor Andrews, thank you so much for being here. You're more than welcome. And thank you, Carol. So this isn't a new problem, but it sounds like it's getting much worse. Can you describe what you're seeing yourself and what you're hearing from residents about what's going on in the woods and around town? Well, it's exactly as uh, you read in the preamble there. Um, it's the, uh, the activity around you know, and the public safety around, that's a huge concern to, uh, to my council and myself. So I'll give you a couple of, of examples. So now we have a, have a security company that we hired several months ago. The security company has to monitor and patrol the area between our high school and Tim Hortons, which is predominant for kids to go to lunch, uh, you know. And we have to have a security company there because some kids are being accosted by folks that, uh, you know, are intoxicated. Uh, for instance, in the daycare, what we were told last night is they're regular programming. So they used to take children for walks. And these children are, you know, preschool, uh, age two to two to school age, you know, to take them for walks on our, our bike trail, to take them out around the, the building for activities. And now uh, they're limited in being able to do that. I have folks that have called me crying because they've uh, their cars, uh, they went to a particular location in town, a store, and their cars have been beaten on demanding money. Uh, I've had folks call and say that they've seen people fornicating on a on a, on a monument that we have here, uh, you know, in, in memory of, of, you know, the United States Air Force uh, here. Uh, and, you know, folks uh, have observed with their children coming from the arena, they've seen people fornicating. Uh, we've had people defecating on, on uh, you know, patios of restaurants and it, cont it continues. Uh, places broken into, uh, people chased, uh, people having near misses uh, crossing uh, with folks crossing the road. And uh, it's it's frustrating. And uh, like I say, as a council, we've had numerous, numerous, numerous meetings. There's not a day goes by, uh, Carolyn, that myself and other members of council are, uh, you know, we're, we're talked to, we're, we're asked questions. And like I say, from our perspective, uh, we've done, we've gone to the folks that we would expect normally to help us. Uh, and it is, uh, it's critical. And uh, we can't seem to get that uh, message across to where we see some tangible results. We did get uh, an RCMP extra patrol some nights. It doesn't happen every night. Uh, you know, the difficult the difficulties with human resources and staffing, we, we understand. But, you know, this is not, you know, this is not uh, a, a just, a, you know, a, a few folks around. This is 80 people, you know. And uh, from a public safety perspective, as I've said to the Premier, this would not be going on or able to go on anywhere else in this province. And can we talk about those 80 people? Uh, we know that this is a layered problem. It's not just drug and alcohol addiction as potential factors here. There's also intergenerational trauma at play here. C can you talk a bit about who these people are? Yeah, we, we haven't focused from a council perspective on who the folks are. We've uh, tried to set back and, co and, and concentrate on the activity. I don't care if there are a hundred or a thousand people in our town, you know, visiting, uh, sitting around, you know, enjoying our community. It's the, uh, the public safety aspect uh, of some of the activity that's around uh, some of the folks that have gathered around that we've tried to con uh, concern ourselves with and try to, because that's, that's what we need to mitigate. That's the concerns. That's the issue that, you know, when a, when a child can't go, from school to Tim Hortons for lunch uh, without being, you know, accosted by, by folks that are intoxicated looking for money or, you know, we've had the reports of, uh, you know, solicitation and things like that. So that's the concern that we've done. Uh, we, we really don't care where people are from in terms of that. Uh, we've concentrated on that activity and the public safety, and that's what we brought forward to government, and that's what we continue to like. That's our main message. And, and I know that you want to focus more on the activity, but, you know, also where the activity comes from is is important. Uh, one of our reporters uh, spoke directly with some of the people who are living out there, and 
One man told her that he was from Natwashish, that he does have a home, uh, and he spends his summer and fall in the town because his community is dry. Alcohol is banned there, and he, he said flat out, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, so if alcohol and drugs are part of the problem here, do you think dry communities are effective? Um, you know, I, to look back at the reasons that, uh, you know, that happened uh, or the decision was taken, I guess, or the route of action was taken in uh, in, in the other communities, you know, that's a, a decision that was made at the time. I know that, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, that impacts uh, why some folks, I've interacted with dozens of them, uh, you know, to, to have conversations to try to understand, uh, you know, if they, they have what they need and, you know, why they came to our community. And yes, absolutely, that is a, a huge concern. Uh, we've, uh, you know, as a council, we've we've put all ideas on the table uh, to our in our representation to uh, to the ministers, and uh, you know, as as part of the uh, acute response team, uh, we put everything on it. You know, and, and and recently, yes, absolutely, that is a huge concern that uh, folks are coming to our community just for uh, just for alcohol. We've suggested that maybe safe spaces be created in other places that enable and allow folks to. Uh, to uh, to deal with uh, with uh, their their issues and uh, you know we keep hearing that there's a long-term approach but the long-term approach is to the homelessness situation uh, and as you've indicated and as you know we've been told that uh, a majority of folks are not homeless that uh, that uh, you know this this public safety concern uh, arises around so you know the long-term approach is is long term i mean that's going to be several years out well, Mayor George Andrews um, will be following along. Uh, good luck with it. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you're more than welcome. I send the invite to you as well as I have to every single minister and every single person that I talk to. Uh, you're more than welcome to, uh, you know, come to our town and uh, we'll, uh, we'll ensure that, uh, you know, you get the opportunity to, uh, to see what we're living through day to day. We're struggling and we need help. And we're certainly going to continue our coverage of this. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. A glimmer of comfort amid the chaos in Port of Basque, coming up an unusual donation for Leafs fans.
Hi, I'm Con O'Brien from the Irish Descendants. On Sunday, October the 30th, we're going to be gathered here at the Mary Brown Centre for a tremendous benefit concert called We Stand on Guard Again in aid of those people who are affected by Hurricane Fiona on the southwest coast. It's going to be a star-studded lineup of some of the best entertainers in Newfoundland. Come out and support this show. Very worthwhile cause, and we look forward to seeing you there. a month now, people across the province have been sending clothes and other necessities to the southwest coast. But this week, a particularly unique donation arrived in Port of Basque. That's where Malone Mullen is tonight. So Malone, tell us about what showed up at the town office earlier this week. Well, the town actually got about 18 big boxes of gear directly from the Toronto Maple Leafs. President Brendan Shanahan, good old Shani, heard that the mayor is actually a little bit of a Maple Leafs fan, so uh, he uh, decided to chip in, as you're about to see. On Monday when I got a call from the courier, uh, the, the, the girl who delivers the courier, she said, I got a couple of parcels for you. Do you want them at the town or do you want them at, uh, at your house? I said, whatever's easiest for you. And then when I came out of a meeting, the, the girls there in the office was saying, the office is full of parcels down there for you. There's boxes down there. And I said, boxes. Only should be a couple. And they said, no, there's cases everywhere. They said down there. And it's all leaf stuff. And I thought it was just, they're always tormenting me about the leafs because I wear leaf clothes a lot <laughs> myself coming here. So the first thing I hauled out was a jersey with my name on it and a signature on it. And when I looked at the signature, I was like, it's autographed. And I said, it, it looks like Brendan Shanahan to me. And there was an envelope there. And when I opened it, it was from the, uh, you know, from the desk of Brendan Shanahan. So and he had mentioned in the letter that, you know, he's thinking about all the people in Port of Basque and area for about the Fiona response. And uh, they were donating uh, as well to the uh, GoFundMe page. And I think the Toronto Maple Leafs donated $10,000 as well to that plus this. And uh, so it, uh, I must say, it, uh, when I read the letter, it, 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 meant, it meant a lot as a, as a Leaf fan getting those things. But... That was almost secondary. It meant a lot that here was an organization, uh, whether it was Leafs or whether it was it just it was the Leafs. For me, it, it meant probably a little extra. But I mean, any organization that would take the time out uh, to do that, it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about Smokey because he had a bunch of stuff. Yeah, Smokey is uh, just as soon as this stuff arrived and sat down that day and we said, you know, what are we going to do? What do we do with it? Like, how are we going to do something like this? And uh, he was the first thing that came in mind because, you know, he lost everything and, you know, he, he came very close to, you know, losing his own life out of it all. And uh, I guess at the time, when you think about it, I guess the stuff that he lost in the home was secondary. But he did lose a lot of, he was a good Leaf fan and he had a lot of Leaf memorabilia and he had lost all of that. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe we'll give him a little surprise and just a little pick me up or. Uh, just to come on over and he get a first first dibs to open the boxes and and uh, get something that that fits him and he could go so that was that was great. My basement was done up as a rec room and I had painted blue and, and I did almost everything what the leaves had. I had jerseys with uh, Doug Gilmore and even playing hockey now for Londa. I had his jersey and my god Hall jersey he was when he played hockey, I even had that on the wall. So you had, it all, It probably took you a lifetime to collect all that stuff. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. The mayor got a letter from Brendan Shanahan. Yes, yeah. yeah, and all the gear. And he called me yesterday and asked me to draw four. I didn't know what four, but I appreciate everything he gave me, just saying. And in front of me, at least too, the organization. And I appreciate everybody who's helped me out. That's one thing I gotta say. Everybody, thanks for helping and giving me stuff so I get back on my feet. So you just saw Mayor Brian Button with his brand new Toronto Maple Leafs jersey. Uh, and Carolyn, I learned today that that is actually one of about 200 jerseys that Mayor Button owns. And uh, he says that this one, for many reasons though, will probably be one of his favorites. <laughs> no doubt, uh, some welcome positivity out there. And we're not done yet. Malone will be sticking around the Southwest coast. So we'll check back in with you Malone tomorrow. Thanks so much for this.
Alderwood Retirement Center is back at it. <laughs> Last night, the seniors hosted their annual haunted house and they're definitely not afraid to dress up and get gruesome. This year's theme is Club Med into Club Dead. Wow, a lot of work went into that. Some pretty gruesome costumes for sure. Thanks so much for sharing these photos with us. Well, most of this week has been fairly warm, but as we get towards Friday, as the cold front moves through, that is going to drastically change, especially up across the Big Land. We're going to start to talk about that potential for some snow overnight Thursday, continuing into Friday, and then uh, skies should clear out for the most part across the island. But again, as that uh, cold front moves through, we will see that drop in temperatures into the afternoon hours. So taking a look at what's going on as far as temperatures go, 
back down to about two degrees in Lab City 5 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and look at that temperature uh, drop as well across the island. Good 10 degrees uh, for most areas by your Friday afternoon. Eight degrees in Gander, 15 for St. John's. That will be in the morning and then as we head through mid morning, early afternoon, those temperatures will drop down to the single digits in line with pretty much the rest of the province. Taking a look at the snowfall forecast, not a whole lot to talk about, but still uh, we could see about a trace of two centimeters. Some areas uh, may see a bit more than that, but overall uh, it won't really stick around for too long. The ground's been fairly warm. Uh, now, as we head through Friday evening into Saturday, the chance of showers will move back in or the chance of flurries will change over to the chance of uh, showers through your Saturday. Not a whole lot to talk about across the island either. Just some cloud cover, maybe a few showers for the northern peninsula, but overall Saturday will be a fairly nice day. Temperatures will rebound just a little bit between uh, 10 to 12 degrees across most of the island, except for the northern peninsula where you'll hover around 8 degrees and then back into the double digits again across parts of Labrador, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Cartwright. Otherwise, you're sitting in those single digits. Taking a look at the long range forecast, not too bad. Uh, temperatures will be a bit cooler between 11 and 12 degrees, back up to about 10 overnight by Monday. Uh, but we are looking at that sunshine, some breezy conditions as well for Saturday. Now for central and western Newfoundland, you're looking at uh, generally some sunshine, maybe a few showers by Monday for western areas of the island. Uh, but overall temperatures will be between 9 and 12 degrees. And then for Labrador, back uh, into a bit of a roller coaster, five to 10 degrees really over into next week. And then showers will continue for Western Labrador, at least the chance of showers with single digit temperatures through Monday. Show you this uh, last shot for your uh, night tonight. Uh, this is the sunrise in Stephenville and Michelle, Michelle shared this photo with us. If you have any weather photos that you would like to share with us, send them to my Facebook page, uh, Twitter, or email them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Ah, oh, just gorgeous. Sunrises have been beautiful lately. Yes, clear skies, mm -hmm. so much sunshine. <laughs> and it looks like uh, Monday so far, it looks like it's gonna be pretty good for the trick-or-treaters. I will, I mean, some places. temperatures are gonna drop off yep. a little bit into the Layer evening up. hours. <laughs> Oh, you're used to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good night.